This episode of the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Podcast is sponsored by my diabetes supplier, US Med. US Med offers free shipping and a 90 day supply with every order. To see how they can simplify your diabetes care, call 1 877 840 8218. I did, and I can feel the love. Remember, there is a much better solution, US Med. And in today's episode, we're going to meet Ginger Vieira, our very special guest. Ginger is the Associate Director of Communications at Type 1 Diabetic Exchange, a weightlifter, speaker, an amazing author, and an expert in the diabetic health and exercise space and a friend. Hello everyone, I am Chef Robert Lewis, the Happy Diabetic, and welcome to the internet's most delicious cooking podcast. I'm here in the kitchen getting ready to explore a healthy, diabetic lifestyle. I want to take the mystery out of healthy cooking and explore some amazing foods and my diabetic journey with my successes and my challenges. Let me help you live your best, happy diabetic lifestyle. So welcome to the kitchen. And if you're new to the show, I'm happy you're here. And with me always in the kitchen is my son, Jason, engineer, producer of the podcast, still on special assignment. Okay, if you're ready to go, let's head to the kitchen. Okay, now it's time for my cooking tips of the podcast. These are things I learned at the Culinary Institute of America while at chef school. And let's start with my first one today. So look, if you're cooking a recipe that calls for sauteing both onions and garlic, do the onions first because they just take longer. If you put them both together, the garlic is probably going to burn. Okay, here's my next tip. After you finish cooking steak or meat, pork chops, anything like that, always let the meat rest. Don't be so quick to cut the meat that's fresh off the grill or right out of the oven or in the pan since doing so will typically spill out all the delicious juices. Let them rest for about five to 10 minutes. That will be the secret of some delicious cooked steak. Okay, everybody, we're back in the kitchen with our very special guest, Ginger Vieira. Good morning, Ginger. Good morning, Robert. I have a question yes, to ask. Yeah, well, listen, some people refer to me like that, so others don't. But listen, uh, I have a question to ask you. Ginger, are you ready to get happy? I am. I'm so ready. I think I woke up ready. Awesome. Well, I know our listeners are going to be excited to meet you and learn all about you. Um, and I've given a little brief introduction already, but why don't you just fill in the blanks and tell everybody who you are and where you're from and why you're possibly hanging out with us today. <laughs> sure. Um, I live in Vermont. I have two little girls and um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1999 when I was 13. The funny little quirk of my diagnosis story is that I diagnosed myself during a seventh grade health fair. No one believed me for a week until I burst into tears because I felt so terrible. Um, and then, you know, diagnosis is pretty obvious after that. I also have celiac disease, uh, fibromyalgia, which I developed during, and I think because of very intense competitive powerlifting training. I also have a slightly lazy thyroid um, and a weird heart rate that is called inappropriate tachycardia syndrome, which sounds very amusing to me. It doesn't really get in my way, and it's a lot better now than it was. So anyway, that's my little handful of chronic illnesses, but I would always follow that up with that. I feel freaking fantastic on a daily basis. Awesome. I really learned um, how to figure out what helps me thrive and what gets in my way. And that is what I really love helping other people learn how to do. 
And so I have been writing about diabetes for probably 15 years. I really started writing about diabetes during my powerlifting training because the doctor that I went to for help laughed at me when I said I was going to compete in powerlifting. And I was like 20 or something. He laughed at me and didn't even really acknowledge the question. And I said, I've been training and I'm going to compete in six months. And I just am having some issues, my blood sugars. And I just like needed some help. This was 2008, 2009, you know, the diabetes online community didn't quite exist yet. And um, so after that, I set a whole bunch of records at my first competition and started learning more on my own and taking what I was learning and putting it into people-friendly language. And I've kind of been doing that ever since in articles and books. Yeah, that's awesome. And you've written a number of books and some that specialize in helping children with type 1 diabetes cope with their disease. Yeah, so I have books for adults, and then most recently I've done a couple for kids. Um, So I've your diabetes science experiment I wrote in my senior year of college it is loaded with typos, but it still gets a lot of people messaging me and thanking me for it. So yeah. I've left it up as is. I can't go back and fix it. It's like too yeah. old. Um, uh. So that's on Amazon. Um, dealing with diabetes burnout, which is very clear what that's about. Uh, pregnancy with type 1 diabetes. It's a month to month guide. Emotional eating with type 1 diabetes or emotional eating with diabetes in general. Um, That's more like a workbook. It's like 30 pages and it's a kind of self-reflection workbook with a lot of insights into how diabetes is messing with your relationship with food. And then um, when I go low is for young kids with type 1 to help them learn what low blood sugars feel like and spot the symptoms sooner because it's actually a really it doesn't come naturally just the moment you're diagnosed and you start having lows. It can take kids until they're like 10, 12 years old to be able to actually feel the symptoms of a low, especially when they're diagnosed really young because they they aren't old enough to have the self-awareness and they haven't had enough years of just feeling normal to feel the sensations that come with low blood sugar. And so it's this cartoon characters, it's animals as the characters, and it's just making it fun and not scary, but also really practical and helpful. And then the other one, I'm looking at my bookshelf to remember, um, is Ain't Gonna Hide My T1D. And that is also um, featuring some of the same characters and style of animals who have type one and she's afraid to go to school wearing her CGM on her arm and what will people think? And she learns Mm. how to deal with the not very nice comments and how to wear her diabetes with pride at school. Mm. That is absolutely awesome. Well, again, thank you for being on the podcast. Um, This is a question we all want to know because we're in the kitchen here. We're in, we're in the happy diabetic kitchen. What is your earliest food memory? I mean, tell us about foods or dishes or the people that prepared it that really, you know, hold dear to your heart and have great memories? I would say eating spaghetti with my family. My father is 50% Italian and raised by 100% Italians. <laughs> and so spaghetti was a very big deal in my family and homemade meatballs that I learned how to make with my mom, who was trained by Italian aunts, you know, to make sure she did it right. Um, So we had spaghetti prior to my diabetes and celiac diagnosis. We had spaghetti twice a week. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have a favorite food? Mm, I mean, meatballs is definitely up there. Yeah. Meatballs and chocolate. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I like, I really love food. I love homemade food. I I like cooking. I don't cook a wide range of things because I just kind of get stuck on the things I like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ginger, do you have a favorite success quote? You know, something that you kind of helps you stay centered and balanced. I would say there's actually two. One, um, my father passed about uh, six years ago. And so this one, I actually have the initials of it tattooed on my body. It's AIO. And he said it all the time. He'd say, Jin, you got to adapt, improvise, and overcome. AIO. <laughs> and he, my dad had been through a lot as a child. And Um, he really was a fireball of energy until the day he died. Uh, so that I hold on to and definitely guides me because, you know, there's not a single person on the planet who doesn't go through life with some obstacles. 
Right, and right. I think AIO has really led me well through any obstacle. Um, the other one that I feel very strongly about that applies to anything, but it can certainly apply to diabetes, is we are what we repeatedly do, which is said by Aristotle. And it's just a really, it's just a really good reminder of, you know, if you're the person that throws something in the trash and it misses the trash can and you leave it on the floor, you are now someone who leaves your trash on the floor if that's what you keep doing. You know, that that is who mm. you become. Um, and it also applies to like more obvious things. Like I, I know when people are, when I was powerlifting, I was about 35 pounds larger than I am now because what I was repeatedly doing was asking my body to pick up something really heavy, maybe three times, right? Mm. And I, a much smaller version of myself today because what I repeatedly do now is jump rope. So I'm asking myself to do something really easy thousands of times. And I am what I repeatedly do, right? The result is this or that based on what yeah. I'm repeatedly doing. So it's, I really like just how this applies to so many different aspects of yeah. who you are. Now, you know, it, did I read somewhere where you actually hold some records in powerlifting? I set a whole bunch of amateur drug testing, drug tested records, meaning nobody was on steroids. There's right. federations where everybody's, you know, jacked up out of their minds. Um, <laughs> I, in my first two years of powerlifting before I started having all the fibro pain, um, in certain, the, you know, records are, it's like, wh who else competed in this federation? I don't know. There's a million federations, but um, my my best lifts when I weighed about 148 pounds, I was that was the weight class I competed in. I did a three. My best deadlift was 315 pounds. My best squat was 265 pounds, and my best bench press was 190 pounds. And so, working my way up to those, I did set some different records in different yeah. federations. And it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. It was the first time yeah. I'd ever felt like an athlete in my life. And um, I did come to a, an abrupt halt at a certain point. <laughs> but, yeah. oh, well, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. So, Ginger, here we are. We're, we're in December, right? It's the holiday season. And um, the question I get a lot from folks is, how do I deal with the holidays? How do I deal with the eating that happens in the holidays? especially when there's so much pressure from what I like to call and what Dr. Bill Polanski will say, the diabetic police, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the loved ones that guilt you, put pressure on you don't. And maybe it's even the people that don't even understand diabetes who, who look at you funny when you're, you know, when you've got potato salad on your plate and think, well, right. you shouldn't be eating that or that cake. Why are you eating cake? You're a diabetic. Yeah. Can you share some thoughts about or some some words to help folks navigate this challenging time? So for me today, I'd say that because of the work I've done on those people over the years, I don't have to deal with that very much now because I explain to them very. I don't let those comments just pass by. I look them right in the eyes. If Let's say it's a new, um, you know, the most recent example I can think of is a couple that my husband and I are friends with who've known him much longer than they know me. And um, they said, oh, you can eat. Like they're, they're just surprised at my love for dessert, my appreciation for dessert. Like, you can eat that. I'm like, I can eat whatever I choose to eat. I just need to make sure it matches my insulin dose. And I know that's not true for all people with different types of diabetes, right? Not mm -hmm. all type right. twos on insulin. Um, but I think it really comes down to look that person right in the eyes and say, thank you for your concern, but I do not need that type of support. And that is not helpful to me. If they really cross that line of telling you what's what. Right. And, right. and if you really, if you need to, part of me wants, I'd have to bite my tongue, but I'd want to say, should you be eating that cake? Ooh, How would you like it if I turn it on you? You know, I do not yeah. need you managing my health thank you the end yeah how was your how was your drink you know like tell me about your daughter's fourth grade play let's move yeah, on redirect them a little bit to yeah. a different topic right to point out that this is not appropriate in any yeah. way yeah. Um, and you can do it firmly but with grace yeah. and integrity you know that really shows them like I, i've got this under control i make my own decisions the end right 
Right. Um, and honestly, if you're eating something and your blood sugar is going to be high the rest of the night, it's still your goddamn decision. So, it is. It absolutely is. Yeah. I don't, you know, whether you're making perfect decisions or not, it doesn't matter. They're your decisions and nobody pestering you is going to be able to change that. Right. It's not helpful. Right. The thing nope. that actually bothers me more is my friends who don't understand enough that I do need to check my blood sugar just to get information. I don't only check my blood sugar when there's a crisis. You know what right. I mean? And yeah. so they'll go, oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, well, I won't know if I'm okay unless I check. And this is like, I do this 30 times a day, like scanning my arm with my Libre. I don't yeah. use a continuous one because the, um, the alarms drive me nuts. Yes. So there's the other, this is the side that actually bothers me the most is people, are you okay? I've had that experience because I have a Libre too. I check it all the time, you know, like you, 30 times a day, whatever. Yeah. It's just normal for me. Yeah. And when, when I scan it and there's people close by who know that I have diabetes and know what that thing is on my arm, um, they always go right to the, are you okay? Drives me crazy. I know. Now, people that don't know what that is, I love to share the fact that I love to share with anybody about my diabetes and that sure. kind of thing. And so I'll just tell people, they'll, they'll say, what's that thing on your arm? And I sure. said, that's, that's my Wi-Fi hotspot. Do you need to <laughs> like join in there? But... <laughs> I love to talk about it because I think education is key to people that don't know much about diabetes. Yeah, it does bother me when we get mad at people for not knowing enough about our disease. Right. We have to teach them. I don't know enough about breast cancer. I don't know a lot about leukemia. Yeah. If, you know, like I have to learn from somewhere, right? Right, so right. You can't get mad. I just, you have to educate people. You and uh, so I'm with you yeah. on that. Point. Yeah. So any, any other strategies or thoughts going into this holiday season about, yes. you know, eating? So this is kind of an overarching, not even just applying to the holidays, but sure. personally, you know, I've gone through, I, I've loved to experiment with different approaches to nutrition and diet. And I wouldn't, uh, I always go into it with this mentality of I'm going to try this and see what it's like versus I need to get on a diet in order to lose 20 pounds in three months. Right. Like that's not there's a difference in. So when I was in the powerlifting world, I was surrounded mostly by bodybuilders who are very strict about their diet. And um, that's where I first learned how to manipulate carbs to get different results. And it's very interesting. And it worked for me for many years. But at a certain point, I was like, you know what? I don't like this isn't serving. Me. I don't like eating this way anymore. And I adapted and started eating more carbs. So I know this is hard to believe, but I recently signed up for Medicare. Now, what about my Libre 2 system from Abbott? As my pharmacy was trying to figure it all out, all the complicated paperwork, I was getting a little frustrated, and quite honestly, so were they. So, I called US Med to see if there was a better way. And guess what? There is. Their motto is better service, better care. It's what they call white glove service. I was worn out by having to make multiple trips to the pharmacy, only to discover the orders were not even ready long lines, or they would say, we need to call your doctor. We need to get confirmation for the refill. It went back and forth and back and forth. And after about two weeks of this, I absolutely had it. I would reach out to the pharmacy and they would say, the doc never called us back. All the heavy lifting and the follow-up. So my recommendation, head over to usmed.com forward slash happy diabetic. Are you ready? for US Med to always provide you 90 days worth of supplies with fast, free shipping. Yes, free shipping. Look, they carry everything from insulin pumps to diabetic testing supplies to the latest CGMs. The Freestyle Libre 2 and 3 and the Dexcom G6. You know my love for the Libre 2 system and US Med is the number one distributor for the Libre 2 systems nationwide. Look. 
If you're just starting with Medicare like me, U.S. Med should be your very next call. They accept Medicare nationwide and a broad private insurance coverage with over 800, that's right, 800 private insurers, plus an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. If you're looking for supplies from everything from insulin pumps to diabetes testing supplies to the latest CGMs, and you're looking for better service, easier service, delivered right to your door, free shipping, U.S. Med is who you should be getting a hold of. Dial this number right now. Well, why don't you wait till the podcast is over? 888-885-0012 or simply go to usmed.com forward slash happy diabetic. Don't wait any longer. Oh, wait a second. I think that's my doorbell. I think that's U.S. Med delivering my 90-day supply now. Call them or go to the website usmed.com forward slash happy diabetic now. Again, don't wait any longer. So I have really loved over the last 15 years with what I would call experimenting with different approaches to nutrition. And I would say that differently as experimenting versus dieting, because I never go into it with some kind of belief that this is what I must do in order to achieve X. So Mm -hmm. for example, when I was in the powerlifting world, I was surrounded by bodybuilders who ate very structured carb amounts at did and it was actually really fun to be around all these people who had to count carbs the way i had to and instead of this like burden of we're doing this because of a disease it was more enthusiastic because they were counting carbs to serve their body's needs to build muscle and stay lean and so it really for me shifted the whole idea around counting carbs of like, oh, this is a tool. This is a tool to serve a purpose. And um, I ate a very kind of rigid approach to carb counts based on whether it was leg day or treat day, or, you know, I only ate dessert once a week, which today I think about, I'm like, how did I do that? I could never, I would never even try to limit myself to dessert Mm -hmm. once a week Mm -hmm. today. Um, And, but it just, For me, what I've really concluded over the years is that there's a lot of different ways to approach nutrition and reach your health goals. And you don't have to just make Joe Schmo's way fit your life if it doesn't work. And that approach back in the day when I was lifting heavy worked for me for many years. I loved it. I chose it. I thrived with it. But at a certain point, I didn't want to have that like that micro focus on everything I ate. And so then I started experimenting with other things, which was just kind of really segued gradually into listening to my body and figuring out how different foods make me feel. And on top of that, I also learned um, intermittent fasting, which I have used on and off for months at a time. And because it feels good. And when it stops feeling good, I stop trying to do it. And it could be because, you know, like I went through a divorce, a stressful divorce three years ago. And, um, you know, divorce part wasn't as stressful as just trying to get my kids to all the right places and not having our new home settled. And I was like waking up at 5 a.m. and zoom, 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 zoom all over the place. And and at that point in my life, intermittent fasting wasn't intentional because I didn't have time to eat till one o'clock. Right. And then at other times in my life, I just wake up and I'm like, I really want breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, there's no like, oh, you failed. You're supposed to be doing intermittent fasting. It's like, oh, you know what? Today, my body is really asking me for breakfast and I'm going to just have breakfast in the morning and it's okay. So just removing all of those heavy rules that society keeps trying to tell you, if you're a good person, you eat this way and ask yourself, how do you feel when you do X? I know that most of the time, if I eat Uh, like starchy carbs in the first two thirds of the day, I don't feel good. It makes me feel lethargic regardless of what my blood sugar is. Yeah. 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 Like grandma's homemade bowl of oatmeal. I feel like I want to just go to bed after that. Right. 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 And one size doesn't fit all. Right. Right. And, and I think people are under the assumption that, 
you know, whatever they read, whatever they saw, whatever they were told, that's what they have to do without really listening to your body. Yes. And without seeing, so having worked around a lot of bodybuilders, so in bodybuilding, if anybody's not familiar, you're trying to get as lean as possible to show off your muscles on stage. Powerlifting is where you're just trying to get strong and perform three different types of movements with the most weight possible. Your body appearance is really irrelevant. And working around all those, I was a personal trainer at this time too. So I was in that land of fitness. And what I really found was that a lot of the people, and now we have Instagram. So these same people now are on Instagram. There is this very toxic culture Mm -hmm. that we're all exposed to quite heavily Mm -hmm. on social media of the six pack person who plans out all their meals for an entire week in Tupperware. And it's the same things over and over and over. And it's implied that like, if you really have discipline and control over your life, this is how you do it. And this is the only way to get a six pack and you need a six, blah, blah, blah. And in reality, many of those people are managing, this is what I saw being in that world. They're managing eating disorders with this as the front. And so Mm -hmm. while they're doing this, they're having these bouts of binge eating and starving themselves and binge eating and starving themselves behind the scenes. And that's not what you're seeing or hearing when someone's telling you that they love the keto diet and they lost 30 pounds. You didn't see them next month where they kind of stepped back from social media and they were eating all the carbs because they couldn't Mm -hmm. sustain the keto diet. Right. 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 And it, when it's that extreme, you know, there's also the flip side of the keto diet, the um, don't eat, any meat and just eat fruits and vegetables. There's a diabetes diet being pushed heavily that that's their motto. And they criticize the keto diet for being so extreme. But it's like, whoa, you went so extreme. That's pretty extreme. Yeah. Yeah. We need need these things. They exist for a reason. I just can't believe that Mother Nature didn't want me to eat fats and protein and fruit. You know, like, it just... So I really would encourage people to like shed that diet culture and start fresh and start with a list of how do you feel when you eat X? I know that if I try to not eat any dessert, all I think about is dessert. So Mm -hmm. what works for me is letting myself have the freedom to eat dessert once a day. And I know that I want dessert the most after dinner. If I eat dessert earlier in the day, then it's just like turns on my sweet tooth and this doesn't work for me. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah. creating my own guidelines. And I'm not a failure if I don't follow them perfectly all the time. But they really guide me on a regular basis that helps me thrive. Yeah. I know in my journey, I've tried lots of different things to try to be the norm, right? Be the perfect diabetic, you know, try to get those perfect blood sugars that everybody talks about or I read about. And I think the one thing that really worked good for me was to try to eat in a way that I could sustain as a lifestyle. Right. Eat the foods I like, eat in moderation, be a check on my portion, a little bit of exercise, taking my medicines when I should. You know, all those things have really helped me, I think, be successful in my diabetic journey. Um, because I had cake for dinner last night and <laughs> I I feel no shame. Right. You know, I, I had a burger. I feel no shame now, yeah. you know. My wife and I will split the burger. And so the portion size maybe is a little more realistic. But right. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to keep from having, you know, enjoying the foods that I love. Um, but I am going to be responsible about the way I take care of my health also. Right. Uh, when people ask me, what is your food? What food approach do you follow? I know they're t- type ones will ask me this. And I know they're trying to find out, do you eat carbs? Right. And I say my only food rule is that I try to eat mostly real food with room in there. If, you know, let's say if you eat four times a day, then the room is the 25%, right? And 75% is mostly real food. 25% might still be real food or it might be gluten-free Oreos, right? Right. Or it might be homemade cookies that I made that are made with real food, but it's still dessert and it's not perfect, right? Right. And, um... So that has worked very well for me for many years, combined yeah, with intermittent yeah. fasting, which I appreciate. Yeah, I've, I've done that too, and I've had really good feelings about that. And I think, you know, it's important for people to check your blood sugars often because that's kind of like your 
report card of how's it going? How's your body doing? And I think you need to know that, um, yeah. that information. And there's no, you know, I say report card, but there's no A's and there's no F's. It's just simply who you are. And again, one size doesn't fit all, I believe. And every day better than the one before. But well, it's, it's challenging. Information. It's just, I right. mean, and again, I know not, not everyone listening to this takes insulin based on what they're eating. So they don't have that same flexibility in, in a sense. Right. Um, right. But, you know, I know that if I do eat a slice of the gluten-free chocolate cake I made last week and my blood sugar is high after, it doesn't mean I suck for eating chocolate cake. It means that I did not guess my insulin dose properly. Right. I did not, right? And right. If you don't take insulin and you don't have that flexibility of adding insulin to a meal, then you can look at, well, if I want to eat chocolate cake, where could I reduce carbs somewhere else to help mm -hmm. keep my daily goals in check that my body can handle that chocolate cake better, maybe. Yeah. Right? No, I, th I think that's perfect. That's a perfect point. Um, you have to be aware of the foods that you're eating for sure. Right. Yeah. Or go yeah. for a walk after eating the chocolate cake. Like just, it doesn't mean you're wrong for eating cake. It, right. it means maybe there's somewhere you could make some adjustments to help um, change the way the cake impacted your blood sugars. Right. I mean, that's the life we live. Yeah. Because if right. somebody, someone, and I mean, I see this all the time and I get scolded by people for encouraging people to eat dessert. And, and this of course all applies to the holidays, but you know, if the only alternative is telling someone you can't ever eat that and they're going to go home and think, well, I can't, like, I can't do that then you've left them with no options. Right. And that's not very helpful. Right. Because you could eat great tasting foods um, with lots of options to help your blood sugars be, be good. Yeah. 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 Sounds like way more fun to me than not. Yeah. So, I mean, if we're going to talk specifically about the holidays, I think it really comes down to, okay, I know that I'm going to be at Grandma Josephine's for dinner tonight and the desserts are going to be awesome and I love her mashed potatoes, I'm going to make sure that the other choices I make today are low carb and really whole basic foods right. so that I'm eating like lighter the first part of the day and I mm -hmm. have more room to indulge and enjoy the right. treats in the evening. Right. And you don't really, I mean, this is just me speaking. I can't speak for anybody, only myself, but you probably don't need to eat three quarts of mashed potatoes. <laughs> Fair enough, right? <laughs> you know, uh, you know. I mean, you could have a smaller slice of pie and still yeah. enjoy the pie, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of strategies that um, that certainly we're going to talk about this month, and uh, and many diabetics really know know about it. It's really doing yeah. the right thing is sometimes difficult when you have a giant buffet in front of you. Yes, um, I know. I tend to lose control. And, you know, so on that same note, there's so much stigma around needing or using um, diabetes medications, but we know that, so like type ones will often tell you that they feel like they, de they never quite feel full. So it's really easy to overeat. And um, type ones also don't produce amylin, a hormone that signals to your brain that you're full, but we don't ever, we're not given something to replace that. We're just given insulin which store, you know, all the other, it's only half the equation. Um, and then in type two, we know that there's dysregulation of things like amylin. And so there's, I really have become fond of and more supportive of medications like metformin, Trulicity, Ozempic that help tell your brain that you are full and help you feel full sooner. If you're having right. a hard time controlling your appetite, you're not a right. failure. It is something that is not working correctly in your body. And these right. medications can help support that. And right. people are very reluctant sometimes to using medication, but your body might really be needing support right. from this because it's not managing those hormones. We, we don't talk about that in like mainstream dieting. The fact that like there are hormones that tell your brain you're full, not just your belly being full. Um, and so, you know, it's something to talk to your doctor about. Yeah, I totally agree with that statement. Um, there's a stigma about drugs and insulin for type twos. I mean, I know 
when I first, I, I, I use mealtime insulin. So, and I've done that now for about four years. And my, and my first comment to my endocrinologist was, oh, I feel like a failure, mm. you know? Um, but the reality was I had to learn that my pancreas wasn't pancreating like it used to, and it needs a little bit of help. And yeah. my life has been enriched with oh, some okay. mealtime insulin. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And we yeah. know that type two for many people is a gradual progression of your pancreas making less and less insulin. Right. So imagine if you just tried to battle that out for the next 20 years on your own and and not sought out the support from getting insulin. Right. You're going to constantly be struggling and feel right. so frustrated. Right. Right. Um, it's like my friend Steve Edelman. Dr. Steve Edelman says all the time, this is a great time to be a diabetic because the technology is amazing and the yeah. drugs are amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I use the Libre 2. I think you use the Libre 2. It's information that you need to really live a healthier, happily, happier diabetic lifestyle, I think. And it's so readily available. Um, and if you don't like pricking your finger, this is a great alternative. Yeah. Reach out to your doctor, um, you know, and I mean, in all, dis in all disclosure, you know, uh, I, I, this podcast is brought to us today by US Med, like the largest supplier of the Libre 2. And oh. so um, I do a lot of work with them. I get my diabetic supplies from them, but it's just the fact that it's so easy to get it yeah. Um, why wouldn't everybody want to use it? And I actually now use the Libre 14 day because I'm old school and I don't like being alarmed about my blood okay. sugar. Pregnancy okay. kind of pregnancy put me off on my phone dinging at me about my blood sugar. Yeah. It's so yeah. intense during pregnancy. Right, right. So I use the 14 day, which people are always like, well, why would you do that if you could use the Libre 2 or 3? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so I have to scan my arm to get my blood sugar. And I hope they never stop making it because... I, it's the only CGM device that I really enjoy using. Yeah, yeah. And I use the Libre 2 that I still have to scan. It's not continuous. It's not oh. the Libre 3, the new one, because um, for some reason, Medicare isn't willing to pay for it. Hard to no, believe that you think there. I'm on they Medicare. Do. They'll get there. But um, I like the alarms because my family loves the alarms. <laughs> you know, they, they want to be involved in my diabetic yeah. care. Yeah. And so I appreciate that. You know, they're yeah. always. Oh, they're, they're, I mean, there are times when I should have some the alarms, you know, like when I'm yeah. sleeping, but I just can't. <laughs> There's yeah. a mental obstacle there. Yeah. For me. yeah. yeah. Well, Ginger, this has been great. Anything else you want to talk about while I have you here? If you are um, type one and listening, I work at T1D Exchange, that org. I'm associate director of communications, and we have a registry where basically you enroll. It doesn't cost you a thing. And researchers use the participants in this registry to learn about different aspects of life with type one diabetes or your experience with glucagon, for example, or fear of hypoglycemia mm -hmm. or telehealth medicine with your doctor. Um, so totally head over to t1dexchange.org and sign up for the registry uh, or join the online community. Unfortunately, it's not open to type twos yet. They want to, but it's like a huge endeavor to start right. um, a whole registry that's focused on type two. And it's, I know it's a discussion, but research costs money. So yeah. it can't just be done on a dime. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'll put I'll, I'll link that address up in the show notes so everyone who's a type one or knows someone who's a type one can head over there and learn more about it. Well, cool. thank you. And where can they find out about you, Ginger? Uh, if you go to gingerviera.com, you won't believe it. I'm over there. <laughs> and there's a lot of it over there. There's, there's a lot great of it over there. There's great articles and your books are available on Amazon. Yes. Um and I've yeah, written a awesome. lot about type 2 diabetes, actually. And you, so you'll see on my website um, articles all about type 2. You have, and I've read many of them, and they're so well written, and you are you are super talented. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, thanks for being on the podcast. But when we come back, I would love for you to play my Rapid Fire 411 game. Are you up for that? I am. Okay. So we'll be right back, and we'll get into the game. Okay, everybody, welcome back. 
I have Ginger Vieira right here. Amazing. The interview that we just did was really inspiring for me. But now it's time to learn a little more about Ginger. We're going to play the rapid fire 411 round. So, Ginger, I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions, and you simply choose your preference. For example, butter or olive oil, riding a bike or hiking, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. You ready to go? Ready. No pressure. Here we are. Olive oil or coconut oil? Mm, olive oil. Mango or papaya? Ooh, neither. <laughs> neither? What's a favorite fruit? Strawberries. Oh, me too. I love strawberries. It's my favorite fruit. Strawberry ice cream, love it. Uh, especially with a little hot fudge on top. Okay, but that's another story. <laughs> Waffles or pancakes? Mm, pancakes. Grilled steak or grilled fish? Grilled steak. Chunky or smooth peanut butter? Smooth. Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day? Valentine's Day. Okay. Um, favorite vegetable? Mm, bean sprouts. Oh, I love beans. With sprouts. onions. With, I'm, oh. I'm obsessed with onions. I love onions. Okay, awesome. Bacon or ice cream? Oh, man, bacon. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Superhero or super villain? Superhero. Roller coasters or merry-go-rounds? Roller coasters. Awesome. Not me. Okay, finally, if you could break bread, have dinner, have a favorite meal with anyone, past or present, who would that be? Mm, I would like to bring my grandfather back to the earth. He died when I was 19. He was awesome. He had the vibes of Paul Newman. People wow. would like mistake him or thought he was a celebrity when they saw him in a restaurant just because he was so cool. But he was actually in the National Mining Hall of Fame. He worked his way from total poverty with um, really abandoned by his father and then a mother who died early. And he worked his way up to being um, president of the Rosario Mining Company, and he mined silver, and he was just really incredible and so thoughtful and always sharing us, sharing with us little nuggets of wisdom. But he died before I was old enough to, you know, I was like still a teenager, still a yeah. kid, really. Yeah. Old enough before I really knew, like, what questions to ask him about his life experiences and just, like, really soak in. I knew he was awesome, but I wasn't old enough to really soak in how awesome he was. And I wish yeah. I could go back and hang yeah. out with him more. Well, if he could come back, I'd love to cook that meal for you guys and just kind awesome. of listen to the conversation. <laughs> we'll be right over. Oh, awesome. All right, Ginger. Well, thank you so much. Again, it was my honor to have you on the Happy Diabetic Kitchen podcast. Um, any final words for the folks out there? Robert, I'm so glad to finally meet you. I feel like I've known you a long time. And if you are listening and you have diabetes and diabetes is hard, which it probably is for you because it is for most people, just don't give up and give your best every day and just keep learning. Yeah. Every day better than the one before is what I like to try for. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I like to think of it as, you know, the rear view mirror in your car is so small and the windshield is so big. It's because it's not about where you've been. It's about where you're going. I so like that. stop focusing on the past because yep. I can't change that. But let's look towards the future, right? Yeah, yep. right. try something different. That's right. All right, Ginger, thank you so much. It was an honor having you. Be sure to follow me on all my social links. You'll find them all at happydiabetic.com. Just look for the links on the top right-hand side of the page. And if you have any questions, simply go to my website, hit the contact link, and I would love to answer any and all questions you might have. And who knows, your question may even become a part of the show. Our podcast is produced and engineered by Jason Lewis, our theme music by the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Band, and of course, our kitchen mascots, Scout and Tucker. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And let me leave you with this thought. Chef Alice Waters once said, I know once people get connected to real food, they never change back. Well, so long for now, and remember, no one loves you more than me. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays.